So, please forgive me for starting a Parisian event with the ultimate Parisian cliché. I do promise at least not to quote Maupassant at you. I start here because societies show off through their monuments, and I want to look briefly at an ancient and a modern wonder of the world and compare them as microcosms, big microcosms admittedly, of the worlds that created them. 4,500 years ago, the Pharaoh Khufu of Egypt demonstrated that he was the most powerful human being who had ever lived by building this absurdly massive pyramid shown to the same scale in this drawing as the Eiffel Tower. But why didn't he build the Eiffel Tower instead? It's far taller, it takes up less land, and it's only 7,300 tons of iron, about 750 times lighter than the Pyramid of Khufu. The answer is not technology. Khufu had an iron in industry with well over a millennium of metallurgical experience at his command. The answer instead is energy. Khufu presided over an agrarian society, a society whose energy source was the sunlight captured by plants grown on farms each year in the hyper-fertile Nile Delta. 90% or so of his population worked hard in the fields to grow enormous amounts of grain, remaining very poor, compared with the 10% who lived off the surplus. But for these rich few, labor was astonishingly cheap. Khufu could comfortably afford the 78 million days of labor that it took to extract, transport, and assemble the vast bulk of his ridiculously big pyramid. However, even under, agra under agrarian conditions, even someone of Khufu's enormous power only used iron for the most essential tools and weapons. This is because it costs a substantial amount of intense heat to smelt ore and work the resultant pig iron. Heat was limited and expensive in farming economies. Heat came from trees. And to get the temperature high enough to make iron, the firewood needed to be burnt into charcoal first, which cost around four-fifths of its original energy content. Trees take up fertile land that could otherwise be used for crops. They grow slowly and burn very fast. Heat costs too much land to use prodigally. For Khufu, the quantity of iron in the Eiffel Tower would have seemed the most outrageous fantasy. It would, in fact, in pre-modern conditions, have required an entire year's production of firewood from an area of woodland around the size of modern Paris. The magic ingredient which made the Eiffel Tower possible, and the rest of the modern world possible, was fossil fuels. Unlike firewood, coal took up almost no land to produce. And unlike firewood, production could be scaled up almost instantly, rather than taking years of growth from planting to harvest. Coal burns usefully hot and has an energy density high enough to reward transporting it from Le Nord, where miners extracted it in the vile and dangerous conditions described so movingly by Zola, and the result was an extraordinary boom in the consumption of heat. We call it industrialization, but in reality, coal energy was just as revolutionary in the domestic and commercial spheres as in the foundries and mills of industry. The sum total of energy available to humans in industrializing countries shot up. Each of Zola's miners contributed 2,500 times more energy to the French economy than a medieval farmer. And with improving conditions, rates of pay for workers rose sharply. So where Khufu had had very cheap labor and very expensive heat, Eiffel 
had very expensive lab labor and very cheap heat. Khufu's pyramid accordingly used 78 million days of labor, but almost no heat to produce. Eiffel's tower used over 8,000 tons of coal, but remarkably little labor. The thing which is remarkable is that the total energy cost of these two buildings is remarkably similar. Human muscles are weak, whereas burning coal is very intense in its energy output. 78 million days of labor produces the same amount of useful work as just 8,000 tons of coal. Or to put it another way, 7,300 tons of iron cost the same amount of energy to smelt and work as it cost to extract, move and work over 5 million tons of stone. A leading American architect of the years around 1900 originated a popular and famous architectural aphorism that form follows function, that buildings are shaped by what they do. I would like to correct this to form follows fuel, that buildings are shaped by their energy context. The Pyramid of Khufu is archetypally agrarian. The Tour Eiffel quintessentially of the coal age. The reason this is of more than historical interest is the climate emergency. Our current use of fossil fuels is pushing the planet toward, towards catastrophic climate change, and we need urgently to escape our dependence on cheap heat. 39% of all human emissions are produced by the construction and operation of buildings. So architecture is right at the heart of the challenge. And our fossil fuel use puts us in this weird one-off category in human history. At present, any seven average Americans will use an amount of energy in their lifetimes, almost all of it from fossil fuels, that would be enough to build the Pyramid of Khufu or the Eiffel Tower, just seven Americans and Europe isn't far behind. We can't keep doing this. And designing our way out of climate emergency isn't just a matter of making existing processes and practices gradually more efficient. Installing a wind turbine on the Eiffel Tower, for example, as they recently have. We need instead to rethink our world much more profoundly around the realities of not using fossil fuels. But we don't need to return to the poverty and inequality of agrarian times. We have renewable electricity on our side. The architectural past has a huge amount to teach us about materials that don't cost heat energy. Timber, stone, earth, straw and reed. And about making our buildings comfortable in all climates without air conditioning or central heating. It's up to us right now to move away from concrete, steel, aluminium, plastics, and excessive glazing, to move away from thermal beige, the never-changing internal temperatures of institutional buildings, to move away from heating space rather than heating yourself when it's cold, and to adapt our lives around energy use rather than scaling our energy use to meet our every desire. If I'm right that form follows fuel, we haven't yet seen the forms, either architectural or more widely, that follow 100% renewable fuel. A zero carbon world, if we design it right, will be fairer, cleaner and happier than any we've seen before. We've got a lot of work to do to get there and we need to get on with it. Thanks very much. Barnabas, thank you so much. I wish I wish we were in person because I imagine that there would be a huge round of applause. Um, not only at your concise, I think, synthesis. Well, I can see John Wright clapping. Thank you, John. Um, I, not only at your kind of very pointed and specific synthesis, synthesis at us in Paris, for those of you who are in Paris, but also for your call to action. And I think um, 
the very the very first thing that one takes away from reading this book is it's a hugely um as i was saying before the call cool energizing read because as you've just said there's still so much to be done and so much of what to be done is actually tremendously exciting um I would like to highlight several key points from this presentation that we can draw out over the conversation. But before I do this, I want to express, because I don't have the physical copy with me, just how expansive and comprehensive architecture from prehistory to climate emergency is. It's split into two parts and 12 chapters. You move as you write from place to place and period to period around the globe, having not actually flown yourself, and you point and you make a point of that in the in writing, stopping to look in detail at case studies. So the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, the Parthenon in Athens, skyscrapers of New York, along the way visiting ancient Rome, Georgian, London, Victorian, Liverpool, and contemporary Chinese megacities, all of which is to say you cast a very wide net. My first question is why tell the story in this expansive way? Um, and how did you arrive at these particular case studies given that your um, kind of tableau was the history of the whole world? <laughs> yes, uh, well, the reason for trying to cover as, as broad a geographical and chronological spread as I could is that uh, I'm aiming to Trojan horse, serious consideration of carbon reduction into architecture schools via the history curriculum if they're not getting enough of it from their design studios and therefore replacing existing architectural history surveys or inflecting them in this way and enabling my colleague architectural historians around the world to batten onto the relevant bits and extend it into their own regions and their own concerns uh, was part of the goal. The reason for the particular choices is altogether less um, uh, less worthy and uh, intellectual, uh, uh, and that is that I have access to English and French as languages I can read, and uh, the literature on buildings needs to be good enough to enable me to understand their construction, the literature in those two languages. Uh, on my case study buildings needed to be good enough and I needed to be able to get hold of enough economic history of the, the areas to find out enough about their energy history to understand the energy context of the buildings. So I was desperately keen to include a fascinating Indonesian mosque and it had to go because I simply couldn't get in English or French the quality of energy history or construction history that I needed in order to make anything more than guesses about the building and quite a few other case studies. I would have loved to have the great Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe uh, and it's impossible to find out almost anything at all about it uh, of the sort that one would need to. Um, and so there's a sort of clustering around topics that uh, English speaking and occasionally French speaking historians have taken seriously in the book. Uh, but the aim was to demonstrate through the things I could get at, that you could apply this approach to any building anywhere on earth. And that has very much proven true. And so in other words, there are whole swaths of buildings and languages waiting to be examined through your lens, accessible to any scholar who might have those languages on the call or beyond. Yes. And if they want to do a PhD on it, then get in touch with me. I'd love to supervise <laughs> it. You have potential PhD students flocking to your email. I think the other thing that struck me about your first response, Barnabas, is that you would have to, as you put it, Trojan horse the climate crisis into any kind of discussion about architecture. I mean, given, as you mentioned in your introduction, that 39% of all human emissions are produced by construction and operation of buildings. In other words, architecture is really at the center of this discussion why would one need to Trojan horse anything in about this conversation into the into the conversation of architecture? Yeah, thanks for pulling me up on that because it's it's uh, it was an unfair caricature. Uh, there, there are huge numbers of people uh, who, in the architectural world, widely defined, who are very very concerned about this, very well aware of what an important issue it is, and working extremely hard against very challenging situations to improve, uh, to decarbonize architecture as quickly and as thoroughly as is possible. Uh, the, the thing that's slow to move, uh, well, is almost all of it because it's 
architecture is so complex, so complex in its relationships with all sorts of activities and economic relationships around it, uh, so heavily regulated, so heavily insured, and all of these things require a total overhaul in order to allow architects to do what so many architects want to do, which is to produce genuinely decarbonized architecture. At the moment, it's next to impossible in almost all conditions around the world to produce contemporary buildings that are very, very low carbon. It's extraordinarily hard to get away from concrete, steel, uh, excessive glass, plastics and aluminium. Uh, and uh, for a huge variety of, of genuinely um, hard to shift reasons. And in those conditions, architecture schools understandably uh, feel a need to train people to work in the world that currently exists. Uh, and it's very difficult to teach an architecture that sort of doesn't quite exist yet. But I think um, the history of architecture, which has for a long time now uh, been a little bit varied in what it was aiming to provide, uh, can, can really weaponize itself to help push this discussion along and help decenter the people who are the heroes of architectural practice still at the moment, with people like Le Corbusier uh, and Mies van der Rohe uh, and other great modernist architects in sort of capital letters uh, who were phenomenally creative and impressive figures, but their architecture celebrated abundant fossil fuels with the same uh, hedonistic glee that the Eiffel Tower does and it's a terrible terrible model for today's architecture and you still get people trying to convert the aesthetics of modernist architecture into more heavily insulated buildings and thinking that that's what sustainable architecture looks like because it has a lower um, operational carbon footprint it, in other words it uses a bit less heating uh, and that's not the answer it, the answer is to rethink around the materials we need to, we know we need to be using to rethink around achieving genuinely lovely internal comfort without using enormous energy inputs. And history shows that until the uh, 17th century anywhere on earth, until the 19th century across bits of uh, Europe, and then and the mid 20th century across most of the rest of the world, until those that kind of spread out of fossil fuels from starting from London in the 16th century, uh, the um, everyone always built in ways that are beyond the current aims of sustainability in their low carbon materials, uh, their locally sourced materials and their passive means of securing comfort conditions. And um, we've got this 14,000 years of well-documented precedent, unlike the chip-making industry or the car-making industry, which are having to work fossil fuels out of their system, having been born to fossil fuels. We have much more fossil fuel-free architecture than we have fossil fuel architecture in our history, and we don't go back to it for technical reasons. We go back to it to sort of think things about the Roman Empire but we, we can weaponize it much more effectively in the fight to prevent climate catastrophe. Yeah, gosh, it's such a great point. And it, it leads very seamlessly into this question that I had, which is tell us about the split between part one and part two. In some ways you've kind of just laid it out, but I'd like to read, so you write um, of part one, this is thousands of years of farming cultures um, that are covered in part one represent much less change then our four fossil fueled centuries of part two that you've just described in part one, which is to say part one of our history, things change glacially. In part two, things do not at all change glacially. I wanted to read this, um, I think really interesting juxtaposition, if you like, of part one in conversation with part two. So you talk about our low energy ancestors and you write, what would these ancient people, so expert in harvesting and conserving their precious supplies of energy, make of modern people driving to artificially lit up and ventilated gyms to try and burn the too easy calories of our heavily processed food on exercise bikes, which themselves require energy input from the electricity grid? 
can you tell us about part one and part two um, and simply how ridiculous the kind of culmination and apotheosis of part two, which is to say contemporary relationship to energy has become? Yeah, well, I think um, the, I don't, I probably sound in a kind of summary of this quite blamey and I don't feel blamey. Uh, I am after all a fossil fuel person myself. I feel the delight of something new and shiny. I feel the delight of very big buildings. Uh, my first uh, book was on the uh, my love affair with brutalist architecture. Uh, I'm not someone who uh, has always wanted the world to be made up of cottages with thatched roofs. Um, but the, uh, the, the challenge that, uh, that, that suddenly realizing that our fossil fuels aren't okay poses turns on its head the Western and technocentric superiority complex, I think, and makes our, the things that we've prided ourselves on for hundreds of years of technological superiority as we see it, uh, and um, an ability to conquer nature through uh, the application of intense fossil fuel inputs. Uh, it, these stop being things that we should be proud of and start being things that we should be uncomfortable with or embarrassed about or desperately trying to stop doing in a way that I am finding hugely challenging personally and hugely exciting intellectually, that uh, when you look at hunter-gatherer societies, there's almost always a very close relationship between uh, cultural expressions like religion and um, beliefs about the relationship with animals you hunt or fruit you harvest. Uh, these things are very strongly culturally mandated to be managed uh, sustainably. So, for example, the Inuit have a uh, belief that, or the traditional Inuit uh, believed that um, that the animals they hunted had immortal souls, as did the humans. Uh, and if you uh, were wasteful or destructive in your hunting practices, or if you refused to share your food with neighboring Inuit who were in need, uh, you, the animals' souls would go back and warn the others to refuse to be caught by you. And that's not the scientific explanation we would give for the unreliability of hunting methods in that kind of extreme environment. Uh, but it is an extremely good set of pro-social beliefs that encourage you to constrain your own population uh, to a level that can be supported by this very, very challenging environment and to manage your resources in a way that is extremely cautiously unwasteful and exploits every calorie and every resource you can get from any animal you kill. And that is something that re recurs in society after society amongst hunter-gatherers and agrarian societies, although they're horrible in their um, inequality, tend to have similar caution about uh, changes that might be environmentally degrading to the all important fields uh, and we have we've moved away from that into a belief that rather than achieving a kind of steady state and then desperately clinging on to it which is uh, can be very narrowing in some ways but is very sustainable as a, as a way of thinking about your energy resources we've moved away from that to a belief that any country that isn't growing at at least two percent is a basket case that's in uh, economically growing and therefore in its energy use tending to grow uh two percent every year uh is is a total catastrophe and its economy collapses and that has a, a self-evident impossibility of continuing that indefinitely and uh it lies it, the origins of the, of the belief in growth are in 17th century london with a housing developer who is the first person to theorize economic growth uh, just as fossil fuels get going because that's the first time there was consistent economic growth i want to go back um this is great i want to go back to architecture because i think <laughs> your your mind is in your mind is in your your new book um which is energy at all levels 
uh, of society. But your original argument in this book is that um, architecture essentially holds up a mirror to the energy context in which it was built. Um, architecture reflects the society and their energy context at the time. Um, and so of today's energy context, you write, our architecture reflects this unprecedented energy wealth in its materials, its technologies, and in the sheer quantity of buildings in use or under construction around the world. I mean, one only has to walk along the streets of New York or any of these other mega cities that you describe in the book to be kind of always, I mean, there's, there's always a joke about um, New York, which is always, it's always under construction. It will never be finished because there's always a new uh, project that's going up. Um, I just want to be very precise here because it's such a big word and many of the people on the call, I imagine, don't have an architectural, even scientific background. Um, since really the crux of your argument, as you, as you said it in the beginning, as you say it recurrently throughout the book, is that form follows fuel, societies reflect energy. Can you define <laughs> this enormous word, energy, and also some related more technical terms, something like energy hungry, energy density, embodied energy, operational energy costs? Yeah, break Sorry. it down. Yeah. Break it down for us, Barnabas. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, energy is in some ways the most difficult to get your head around of these things in the sense that the physical definition of it is deeply disappointing. Uh, it is um, the capacity to do work. Uh, the reality is that it's the capacity to do absolutely anything and not merely a human capacity, but the capacity of, uh, of electrons, the capacity of uh, one atom's relationship with the neighboring atom and so on. All of these are defined by energy. In fact, physicists uh, ever since uh, um, Einstein's famous and um, to almost all of us baffling equation E equals mc squared have uh, defined mat mass as also being made up of energy or transferable into energy, which comes to the same thing. So everything is made of energy for a start, but the level at which it's, I think, most useful to think about it from a from a sustainability and architecture point of view is in the relationship between um, uh, between the way that the sun's energy ends up usable by humans. So uh, in the case of fossil fuels, that's via the sun uh, shining on plants in uh, uh, the Jurassic period predominantly, but not or the Carboniferous possibly. Um, there's uh, several phases of laying down. Um, and uh, these very ancient um, fern swamps uh, collected lots and lots of the sun's energy photosynthesized it into sugars and then uh, were crushed by geological changes or by the weight of the ferns above into fossil fuels deep underneath the earth. And when you dig that out and burn it, you are using ancient sun energy. Uh, in agrarian societies and hunter-gatherer societies, you have very little of that, if any. And what you mostly depend on is the 1% uh, or less of the sun's energy that can be converted by plants into more plant uh, and the energy that that plant runs on. And then other things eat the plants and do stuff with that energy, or you burn the plant and get the energy out that way. So energy is the capacity to do work. And it is uh, it all originates from the sun in the context of human affairs. And it is um, uh, well, almost all um, nuclear energy is an exception, but, uh, but um, it's, it can be in the form of food, it can be in chemical energy, it can be in form of chemical energy for fire, it can be in the form of uh, gravitational potential energy, which is heavy things being lifted up high. Um, so, um, for example, water mills run off the weight of the water running down. Um, uh, and each of these can be talked about by physicists and engineers through the same quantity measurements, uh, which is what makes it such an incredibly powerful concept in interpreting the physical world. And that's been known since the 19th century in the sciences. It's been the great unifier of the sciences since then. I think in the 21st century, it needs to become a unifier of the humanities in the same way, uh, because it's such a powerful ex explanatory tool. Uh, in terms of the specific types of energy that are most important to architectural discussion, embodied energy means the energy that it costs to build a building in the first place. Uh, so 
uh, the energy to make the materials, the energy to transport the materials, and the energy to put them together into the building. Those together go to make the embodied energy. Uh, and the operational energy means the energy that you then spend every year on heating, lighting, uh, cooling, and other functions like that. Uh, and um, lifetime energy would then also include maintenance processes and uh, dismantling processes at the end. Uh, all of these are highly measured and discussed at the moment because they're a huge part of architectures. Well, they are together, almost all of architectures. Um, carbon footprint, along with the emissions from cement, where even if you use only renewable electricity to make cement, which incidentally nobody does, um, the uh, it still emits enormous amounts of carbon dioxide, because for each ton of limestone that enters the cement plant, it's heated until 40% uh, of it goes off as carbon dioxide, and you're only left with 60% of the original ton as usable cement. I want to um, do a similar thing that I did previously about kind of putting part one and part two in conversation, which is to try and express using, uh, you know, a phrase from from the book, um, just how mad <laughs> this evolution of energy um, really is. So you write um, kind of, again, putting contemporary energy in, in relation to decades, centuries ago. Um, so a ton of oil can replace over 150,000 hours of human labor, which is over 19,000 eight hour shifts. And at August, 2022 prices, all that work, so the ton of oil can be had for $332. With world oil consumption reaching 4.66 billion tons, in 2018, it provides the equivalent energy bonus to human society of more than 400 billion extra people doing manual labor for an average US working year. I mean, it, and, and this is just one moment of so many moments in Barnabas's book where your mind just explodes. <laughs> I think. Yeah. The, 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 the numbers are very, very big and getting mm. away from fossil fuels. The reason we use fossil fuels so much is not because we're evil or stupid, but because they're fabulous sources of energy mm. and they have an energy density. In other words, the weight of material mm. uh, in relation to the amount of energy you can get out of it. So the energy density of um, of um, uh wood is very much lower than the energy mm. density of oil for example mm -hmm. and oil also flows and therefore is incredibly useful for machines mm. uh, because you can mechanize it fully uh, so the uh, there are very strong reasons why we use fossil fuels as heavily as we do they enable us to do a lot of things that we could never do before as a species uh, many of which are very positive you know our, our medicine is fabulously better than any creature's ability to uh, to to heal itself non uh, endogenously has ever been, uh, and uh, it's a product of our energy intensity before before coal exploitation and for several for at least another century and a half afterwards. Doctors were much more likely to kill you than help you in almost all contexts. And once you get the high energy science that supports modern medicine. Uh, the quality of their insight just shoots up. Um, and there's, uh, you know, the, the the life expectancy of children today in um, uh, in the poorest countries in the world is better by quite some way than the life expectancy of children in the richest country on earth, Britain, in the 19th century. That's a very, very rapid turnaround and eminently worth having, uh, not some anti-humanist sort of... Um, we should all just die and then the planet can get on with its its own business. I think that humans are extraordinary and wonderful. And our use of fossil fuels has come about for understandable and um, uh, and often valuable reasons. But luckily, they've got us to a level of technical understanding that means that if we can persuade ourselves to do so culturally, then we can definitely get out of this situation without catastrophe. But we do need to persuade ourselves and we need to avoid the kind of level of culture war that means that half of humanity deliberately plunges us into climate catastrophe to annoy the other half, which is how it slightly looks like going at the moment.
It's interesting you was use the word cultural because I, I mean I think I think it is cultural. I think it's also intellectual, and this is another point that I wanted to make. Um, is that your argument, and again, this is why, and we were talking about this before, why the book feels so exciting and why there's so much to say. Um, and while you will continue to say it in your new book, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but the argument is a frame, it's an intellectual um, frame, and you're participating in this paradigm shift of the environmental humanities, energy humanities. Um, and I think what's striking, and so you mentioned somebody like Le Corbusier or really anyone in the book, you write that most of these people, most of these architects and clients would not have interpreted their own architecture in terms of energy. Clients and their builders have often had an impressive practical grasp of the relationships between labor, fuel and construction. But before 1950, they certainly did not theorize them into a single notion of energy. But however they understood energy, it acted on them. Energy is like gravity. You do not need to theorize it to be bound by its rules. It's almost like this, it's, as you say, it's, this, it's been this kind of invisible force. And now that we, now that you, that we're, it's no, we're no longer like shrouded in the invisibility of, I wouldn't say ignorance, but kind of lack of concern. Um, now there's the moral implication of, because we know that we're bound by its rules, we have to act. Did you ever get the sense, I mean, as a, as a historian, one is very cautious in history of looking back and applying contemporary, um, contemporary kind of frameworks on the past. Did, did you feel that tension? I mean, were there some arguments that you kind of hesitated to make because you felt like I'm really pushing a 21st agenda on, you know, prehistoric people who had no sense of, of where they would end up, you know, thousands of years later, hundreds of years later? Uh, definitely not for prehistory or for um, agrarian societies um, where their concerns are so openly and explicitly those of energy they just call it food and um, call it wood firewood um, and call it animals for, for labor and so on um, but they, they they itemize it but they are profoundly concerned by it. the point at which I definitely have indulged myself with massively unfair teleology and I'm not sorry uh, is modernism uh, and the reason for that is because it is we're still in it and therefore and I I love it. I love it aesthetically and it's been a hard process for me to come to an understanding of how desperately we need to get away from uh, the the legacy of the wonderful Le Corbusier and um, and his generation uh, but they are still they we still use their structural ideas their spatial ideas their technical ideas in some form um and their palette of materials as the normal architectural palette worldwide. And that is desperately problematic. And almost all contemporary architectural historical activity focuses on the last century and a bit, and largely on modernist architects. And in a spirit of discussing things to do with uh, aspects of their ethics sometimes but very rarely does it confront the extent to which they're terrible models for now and so most architects have gone through their training without anyone saying that if you build things like the Villa Savoie just outside Paris by Le Corbusier uh, you are building based on a celebration of wasting fossil fuel energy because that's what that building is every wall and every floor almost uh, is to outside rather than the rooms huddling together as rooms in Paris always had in order to stay warm in the winter. Uh, the um, the uh, entire envelope is very thin and entirely un or significantly under insulated. The window frames are metal, the windows are single glazed. Uh, the, um, uh, the whole thing is amply um, central heated to deal with this uh, in a way that is celebrating the freedom of cheap enough central heating for rich people in Paris to just blast the central heating out and live in something that is totally and utterly unsuited to the winter environment or the, the spring or summer or, or autumn environment and too hot in summer. Um, but this, um, 
this is still held up as a building which has things to teach us in a positive sense. And it's a building that has an enormous amount to teach us, but all of it in a negative sense. There isn't a single useful lesson that the Villa Savoie or any other Le Corbusier building can teach us directly about how to build now because they are buildings about prodigal use of fossil fuels. And this is why, as you head to your conclusion, towards the end of the book, you describe this as a paradigm shift and you use very specifically, and you used it in your introduction very specifically, this is not a question of redesigning or as you say, designing our way out of it. This is a question of rethinking, challenging every assumption, you say, challenging our habits um, and threats to this paradigm shift, you write too, are human conservatism and inertia. The flip side of this, I suppose, and you also gestured to this in your in your presentation, is that from these radical changes, hopefully coming very, very soon, as soon as this call is over, um, new wonders will appear. Do you see hope? And can you talk about possibly Cork House as an example of this of this hopeful future that looks yeah. strikingly, of course, ironically, like the past? <laughs> Yes, well, I think the past is is the biggest source of inspiration we have. The more distant past is the biggest source of, insp of valid precedent and useful inspiration we have for the near future. Uh, not that we will build exactly like the more remote past, but that um, that we need to have we need to build with a kind of um, material palette of the remote past. Uh, built for a renewable energy present and the result i think could be very exciting and very beautiful it will certainly be enormously different from place to place because unlike modernism who part of whose excitement at fossil fuels was the idea that you could build the same building anywhere on earth and just change the the servicing from heating to cooling when you got to hot places um and the uh and by the 1960s, they're starting to fantasize about getting rid of buildings entirely and just having a sort of plastic bubble that you pump the right temperature into and pump music into and pump entertainment into. Uh, and you can sit it on any kind of rock or street corner, wherever on the earth you want and set up your life and sit in it naked, smoking dope uh, and um, and uh, living the dream because the machine in the middle of the room can turn any environment into a pleasant place to be. And it's a kind of total total it's totally logical uh, conclusion to modernism and a total nightmare from a sustainability perspective it's exactly wrong um and you know they didn't know about the harm that fossil fuels were doing so fair enough but yes i can see hope and i do see hope uh that um and actually the cork house which is a wonderful um, private house in eton outside london uh which is uh, very very cleverly designed and rather beautiful to use uh, materials that sequester more carbon, that absorb more carbon when they were growing than it cost to put them together into the building, and that um, is very highly insulated by the materials they've used naturally, and very beautiful and very lovely, and very, very low carbon. Uh, the uh, It's not, the architects themselves made it explicit, that it's not scalable. Oops. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, uh, it's not scalable. You couldn't mass produce this for everyone. There isn't enough cork in the world and so on. So uh, it's not a kind of uh, magic bullet, uh, but it's a, it's a lovely one-off example. Since finishing the book, I've come across the work of Yasmin Lari in Pakistan, who is building enormous quantities of zero carbon or very low carbon emergency housing for people in disaster struck areas of Pakistan, of whom sadly there is no shortage because of uh, the earlier earthquakes and the recent floods, it's a, a terrible situation. And she is, after a career as a really big name uh, Pakistani East architect, so the first woman uh, in, to be trained as an architect in Pakistan, very successful career building, among other things, the state oil company's headquarters. Uh, and then after retirement, she suddenly realized that she'd been building for this tiny percentage and in a very high carbon way. And so ever since then, she's now in her early 80s and she's ever since retirement been building 
these emergency projects using almost no carbon intense materials uh, for uh, paid for by local people uh, and built with local people's labor using local materials uh, modified from the traditional designs to improve their earthquake proofing and to improve the efficiency of the ovens. So it's not just a case of looking backwards. It's a case of modernizing and tweaking. And frankly, if people in disaster struck areas of a much poorer country can manage to produce architecture that's very near to zero carbon, uh, at the point of the, the greatest need of their lifetimes, it shows up the dismalness of so many of our uh, building industries efforts to slightly reduce carbon here or there or to put up a poster claiming they are. Thank you. There's still so much more to say. I knew there would be, but um, thank goodness you're writing another book. Um, this gets to a question. I want to read a comment from Vikem and tie it into um, a question that I had. So Vikem writes, I have, I have a, <laughs> I've never heard someone confess like this. I have a weak spot for cement. Should I feel guilty that the production of cement depends on high levels of fossil fuel consumption, a major contributor to climate change? How? Yes. <laughs> You're like the architect you just described. You're repenting for your first book. <laughs> How um, should I reconcile my love of cement, brutalism in particular, with the high levels of fossil fuel consumption? I wanted to just dovetail off this comment to just read another staggering um, fact from the book. You write, the scale of China's building boom over the past decade is highlighted by a remarkable statistic. Here is another one. The USA, the world's biggest economy throughout the 20th century, used 4.4 billion tons of cement over the course of the entire 20th century. In just three years, from 2011 to 13, China, by contrast, used 6.4 billion tons. Cement typically makes up only about 20% of, oh, yeah, anyway. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. So I suppose- The answer <laughs> is that all the concrete, so you can love existing brutalism and you should love existing brutalism with all your heart, uh, and try and keep every single bit of it standing because it's fireproof, resilient structure that will last a good long while. And therefore, we can't afford to demolish any of it because building fireproof, uh, resilient, multi-story structures is one of the hardest things to do in terms of sustainable materials. So uh, loving brutalism is completely consistent with um, doing the right thing environmentally, provided you don't uh, do anything to perpetrate more brutalism now uh, because the um, the cement means that concrete needs to be used extremely lightly. We're going to need it enough for uh, uh, holding back the rising seas. Uh, so we can't afford to use any of our carbon budget on using concrete where timber or stone would do the job. And at the moment, we're using it as a universal worldwide default in a way that is uh, very, very problematic. It's the most used material after water on the planet. And uh, it's got this enormous carbon footprint. That means that the concrete industry on its own, the cement industry on its own, is 8% of all human fossil fuel emissions. Thank like you. Carbon emissions, sorry. Um, I, had, I have a question from Jacob who writes, if form follows fuel and energy has been incredibly cheap since the Industrial Revolution, isn't the first place more of an economic issue of correctly, correctly, sorry, correctly pricing energy or providing cheap, clean energy instead of an architectural one? Can you, can you talk about energy pricing and also renewable energy? Yeah, I think this isn't an either or. It needs to be tackled from all directions at once. Uh, by everyone in all aspects of their working and home lives, we all need to think about the ways in which we are contributing to or conniving with uh, carbon intensity and carbon intensification. Uh, so there are macroeconomic tools needed to help with this, uh, but um, that's not this book. <laughs> um, the, uh, the dangers, of course, of doing it through energy pricing, we're seeing at the moment with the energy price hike, thanks to the odious Putin's appalling actions against Ukraine, uh, where we're seeing that poor people are being hit desperately hard by it. Uh, and that is a terrible way of improving the situation. We are seeing as well, though, that an awful lot of people uh, who are a bit better off 
uh, aren't in a position where they're completely freezing to death or going without food, but are in a position where they're cutting their energy use voluntarily. And that's excellent, obviously, that, that tranche. So the right forms of price mechanisms are great. But in architectural terms, we can't just wait for that um, to happen. We also need to find the solutions and work out how to scale them. Uh, architecture has always progressed via um, a smaller sort of arrowhead of um, innovators, then having the, the solutions in place for when uh, the rest of the world wakes up to the fact that they want something like that. And there's always been also an element of pull to it that modernism spread in its uh, final form, partly because people like Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe made it so exciting and so beautiful. And therefore, if we can make from within the architectural world, buildings so weak makingly beautiful and so uh, so heart liftingly exciting in their low carbon architecture that people long for them and the rich start to use them as status symbols and the middle start to long for them and the government starts to subsidize them for the less well off then we solve the problem a lot faster than if we just wait for price mechanisms to force uh, economic change yeah, and it's it's a great point that we didn't necessarily have time to go into, which is that this idea of scaling up is really central, and you talk about it again and again in the book, and you've also just gestured to another really important point that we really have to get to before, and then I will go to this question from Sharma, but essentially that architecture, the story of architecture is so much more than the story of architecture, you argue in the book, that it turns out to be the story of humanity, because architecture not only mirrors the energy context, in which it was built, but as you argue and show, it mirrors social, economic, political, religious, and intellectual structures. This will be the subject um, of your new book. Um, can you tell us about this, this mirroring um, effect? Yeah, I mean, uh, human culture and all its expressions from religion and politics uh, to architecture to art, um, they're always very, very closely associated with energy uh, patterns. It's not that energy determines what people do, but energy defines certain limits on it and defines certain uh, better ways of doing things or more rewarding ways of doing things, which therefore uh, become, it's like tilting a pool table. You can still hit a ball in any direction you like, but it's most likely to go in the downhill pocket. Uh, and energy is the, the tilt on the pool table. So it's not determinant, but it's very strongly um, uh, shaping of, of human practices, including surprising things like uh, marriage practices, definitions of what a family is, uh, gender relations, uh, the even de definitions of gender. These are things that turn out to be extraordinarily interestingly fluid around uh, the nature of energy harvest and energy ownership and um, energy relations within societies uh, time and again in this uh, totally, um, totally fascinating way to the point where there are people, there are groups uh, around the world in a few cases who believe, for example, that you can have more than one biological father for a child and the evolutionary uh, uh, advantage that this belief confers is that uh, it occurs in very low protein, seasonally very low protein contexts, where the additional father gives small amounts of supplementary meat to children for whom he feels responsibility. And therefore, uh, something like a 30% increase in the chance of surviving to 16 is experienced by children with more than one father, because they get protein in the lean season. And that uh, that belief relating very directly to the need for sustenance uh, and giving rise to this kind of um, belief that science would find comical, but that actually uh, in energy evolutionary terms makes absolute sense. Gosh, it's so interesting. Um, I, I suppose outside of your realm of research, because again, I really believe that it's, it's almost, I was thinking about other moments in the kind of history of knowledge where things like this have happened, you know, it's like a, it's kind of like applying a Marxist lens or a gender lens or a post-colonial lens. Um, and I, you know, you're in a kind of ecosystem of other researchers and scholars. What um, area apart from your own research are you most excited 
that you think has the most potential in the coming years or even months? I think um, I think there's not many areas which couldn't become more bitingly relevant now by asking the question, how does this relate to energy systems? Uh, so I, I think that applies across uh, forms of cultural analysis as well as technical analysis. Um, and I'd love to see it um, spreading, not to colonize everything with my particular take on it, but mm. to allow the complexity and sophistication of existing academic inquiry to add this central question of our time uh, and this existential threat to their thinking via just asking the question all the time in the back of your mind what about energy mm. Mm -mm -mm. yeah it's a haunting question and and as a result of reading your book you do start like any you know transformative encounter intellectual encounter you start to see and experience the world while you're reading again afterwards in totally new ways and I think very productive ways because it's you know you're you're highlighting this invisible as you say this kind of invisible thing like gravity um, but it needs to be brought to the fore um okay this will be the last question this is from Sharma who thanks you for a lovely talk and says um kind of departing from your mention of Yasmin Lari and her works on indigenous techniques she says uh my question is that isn't vernacular always sustainable using everything wisely and balancing the ecosystem um I guess and then I, I would have a kind of related question which is certainly from the point of view of public policy which some of you on the call know um, I'm studying you know there is this tension between the local and then the global and in some in some areas um, the the kind of problems that communities and people are confronting they're similar, you know, whether you're in Paris, it might be a similar problem as somewhere in Madrid or somewhere um, basically elsewhere in the world. And that by coming, coming together on the global stage, you have more power because you're united by this unifying global issue. On the other hand, there is, as um, Sharma points out, the, the importance of attending to the local. Um, can you talk about this, this tension between the local um and the particularities of indigenous knowledge versus global power and having a global platform yeah i think a huge part of the expansion of carbon intense practices around the world has been associated with um the uh the baggage of colonialism mm. both during colonial times and since uh, and globalization is a sort of corporate colonialism that um uh, that's extended and you know it does there are advantages to some of the technical changes uh, and the, but the overall system change from uh, from very low uh, energy intensity practices to um, very high energy intensity practices is obviously one that that is uh, the great crisis in in human affairs mm -hmm. uh, so yes I think um I wouldn't go as quite as simple as suggesting that we've just gone in the wrong direction, moving away from vernacular, because I think there are complexities to that, you know, things like the the tendency of the English vernacular to massive city fires, unless you're in an area with a lot of stone, uh, because we built London, for example, in uh, wood and thatch, and then did blacksmithing in the immediate neighborhood of thatch and fires were was so normal in fact that um, contracts property contracts used to say this is the boundary between these properties until the next fire because they knew that the buildings would all burn down at some stage and then you could rationalize the boundaries and make two better shaped buildings out of it and that mm -hmm. is not a situation uh, that i'm keen to go back to or mm -hmm. that i'm or that i'm sad to have left behind but at the same time there is a kind of um uh, a general tendency for the move away to, from the vernacular to be a move towards much greater energy intensity and finding ways to rediscover the best things about the vernacular whilst simultaneously uh, br bringing to everyone on earth the advantages of good quality renewable energy uh, so that we end up with a world where uh, many of us are probably slightly less materially rich than we are now, 
Mm. Um, but uh, but the, the 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 world's poor are better off than they are now, and all of us are living a life with a better balance of leisure, a better balance of political uh, representation, uh, less tension between nations. Uh, water is the great threat on that, but renewable energy is mercifully evenly spread in a way that makes the oil wars of the 20th and early 21st century um not such a threat in in the context of mm. uh, of a genuinely renewable world energy system so there's good things as well as bad to come a couple mm. of people have asked what architecture should be building in now and i'm keen not to yes yes like that that question from uh, from them and the answer is that it depends where you are and the best guide to it is to look backwards. Uh, so uh, if you look back to the materials that were being used before the adoption of fossil fuels in your area, in your region, then they're probably a pretty good place to look uh, because they're probably able to cope with the weather. They're probably able to cope with, uh, with to improve your experience of the climate. Uh, and they'll certainly be very low energy. So mm -hmm. that's often stone. Stone is the big neglected material of sustainable architecture that people talk a lot about timber but stone is much more rapidly scalable because you don't have to wait for it to grow uh, you can get an awful lot of it out of a relatively small hole we're getting it out anyway to make it into concrete so we might as well get it out not burn it and build with it mm -hmm. and uh, it's um it's very durable if you build it with it in big chunks it can then be reused if that building becomes obsolete uh, and the other great material of new of future architecture is the buildings we already have, where keeping what we have, improving its environmental performance to reduce its energy consumption and make it resilient over ever increasing heat uh, is the uh, the biggest tool in cities like Paris and London, which already have a, an enormous quantity of buildings, keeping all that we possibly can of what's already built uh, is the most powerful tool available in contexts like that. 